Welcome back to Ask the Compound. Our email here is askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Today's show is sponsored by Future Proof. I just did a little video promo this morning for Future Proof. Someone asked me, what am I most excited about? I, I had bullet points, Duncan, because I have so much. The location, you know, the beach. They have a perfect little running path, uh, walking path that follows the beach. There's good food, drinks, content is great. We have all these different speakers, live podcasts. Last year, there was some professional athletes, your favorite bloggers, social media personalities, financial pundits. You might even see us filming on the beach, uh, movie recreation. I thought of a scene, Eternal okay. Sunshine. How about that? Oh, There's a lot one. of beach good scenes one. in Eternal Sunshine. There's also great socializing, ad hoc conversations with advisors, investment managers, even normal everyday investors. A lot of people who watch our shows come to it. Uh, we were just actually talking this morning about what we're going to do with a live, what we're going to do for the live version of this show, to have people who are there ask us questions. So it's going to be great. Last year was hands down the best financial event I've ever been to, and there was in a close second place. But as, as fun as that was, I think we actually learned a lot about how to make it better. So it's going to be even better this year. So get your tickets now. They tell me prices are going up in 22 days. It's futureproof.advisorcircle.com to sign up. So do it now. Yeah, it's going to be All a lot right. of fun. Um, Looking forward to it. Yeah. Great. So, Duncan, your hat today, is that the value of your brokerage account or what? Almost. You were close. It's the alpha that I have in my account. So. All right. Let's do a question. A lot <laughs> today of is a rough today. day. Thanks, thanks for picking on me, though. Today's a pretty rough day for my, my <laughs> stocks, as you can probably, right. as you can assume. Okay. Uh, up first today, we have a fan from Japan. So, konnichiwa. Or maybe it's more kanbanwa this time of day. But uh, big fan of the compound from Japan. My 59-year-old mother is one of those people who doesn't believe in putting money in the stock market because she's afraid to, quote-unquote, lose it all. There are a lot of people in Japan who are still traumatized from the stock market bubble collapse in the 90s. Now she's got about $300,000 in cash sitting in a checking account, literally earning nothing. This year, I was finally able to convince her to open a brokerage account and invest $100,000. I manage this account and decide to allocate 60% to a 2030 target date fund. That's 40% stocks and 60% bonds and the other 40% to an all-world stock index fund. I chose this allocation because I want to believe that having an increasing allocation to bonds is prudent for someone her age, but I'm constantly fighting the internal battle to allocate more to stocks so I can improve returns. She plans to retire in eight years, has no debt, and expects to have a decent pension. So this money is largely supplementary. Should I ditch the prudence and allocate more to stocks? It's kind of a YOLO question, right? right? I compl well, kind of. I completely understand where the mom is coming from here as it pertains to being nervous about financial assets if she's thinking about it from a purely Japanese perspective. John, throw up the growth of wealth. This is the MSCI Japan Index since 1990. $1 invested in Japan in 1990 grew to $1.32 by the end of April this year. And that dollar was underwater for almost 30 years. On the other hand, a dollar invested in the S&P would have grown to more than $23 in that time frame. So we're talking... 10% annual returns for the S&P since 1990, 85 basis points per year for Japan. And this is actually from the perspective of a U.S. investor. If you were in Japan, it was actually worse when we're talking about in yen terms. So why did this happen? I, I consider myself something of a financial historian. Others may disagree with it, but that's, that's, this is my opinion. Japan has had the biggest financial asset bubble in history in the 1980s. There really aren't that many books written about it for some reason. Um, the best one I've found is this... Uh, Devil Take the Hindmost by Edward, Ch Edward Chancellor. And it's basically one of the better books ever written on financial manias and crashes. And he has a whole chapter on the Japanese bubble. It's not a whole book, but I've, I've compiled through this book and some other sources over the years some of my favorite stats and anecdotes. I'm going to run them through to, to show how crazy things got in Japan in the 80s. 1956 to 1986, land prices in Japan increased 5,000%, even though consumer prices only doubled in that time. So inflation doubled, land increased by 5,000%. By 1990, the Japanese real estate market was four times the value of the real estate of the United States, despite being, despite being 25 times smaller in terms of land mass and having 200 million fewer people. Tokyo itself was on equal footing with the U.S. in terms of real estate values. There were 20 golf clubs in Japan, and this is in 1989, that cost a million dollars to join. Uh, the PE of the wow. Nikkei was, yeah, P on, on the Japanese stock market was 60 times trailing, 12 months earning. The CAPE ratio was 100 times, which is more than double what it was in the U.S. with the tech bubble. Uh, Japan made up 15% of world stock markets in 1980. By 1989, it was 42%. 
1970 to 1989, Japanese large cap stocks grew by 22% per year for two decades. Small cap stocks in Japan were up 30% per year for 20 years. It was just crazy. Stocks went from 29% of Japan's GDP in 1980 to 151% by 1989. Just real estate and stocks at the same time, just a cluster of a bubble. If you want to learn more, read the book to figure out why it happened. But there are people who are too scared to invest in the U.S. stock market. And the returns here have been fantastic for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Pick your long-term time horizon. In Japan, they haven't gone anywhere for three decades because of how out of whack things got in the 80s. Now, side note here, the MSCI data goes back to 1970. If you take the Japan returns going back to 1970 to today, it still returned 8.6% per year, despite going nowhere for 30 years. That's how crazy things got in the 70s and 80s because things were, so it was almost 9% per year still for the long term. Uh, the big question is, how do you get someone to change their psychology when it comes to the stock market after they've been scarred through something like this, right? This is kind of like U.S. investors in the, after the Great Depression. No one wanted to touch the stock market. You know, stocks for the long run wasn't a thing then. So I think you could walk your mother through historical rates of return and inflation rates and compounding and interest and earnings and dividends and all that fun spreadsheet stuff that I like to pay attention to. But numbers and spreadsheets are essentially useless when we're talking about changing someone's behavior, especially when they've been through something like this. I think it's hard to change change how you do things, especially after you're, you're that old. So I think you have to lean into the emotions here. So remember, Duncan, remember the scene in Shawshank, John, throw this up here, where the inmates are all working on the roof and Andy Dufresne asks Captain Hadley if he trusts his wife, right? <laughs> awesome, awesome scene. And I, th and he, you know, runs him through the, the IRS stuff about a gift and, uh, he's coming on soon, but I think this, this would mean Bill Sweet would do amazing in jail. Wouldn't he as a tax guy? That's how Andy Dufresne so. basically survived jail. Yeah. I think you have to basically ask your mother the same question. Like, Mom, do you trust me to handle your finances and investment in a prudent matter? You know, I'm not going to gamble. I'm going to diversify. I'm going to invest, not speculate. I'm going to manage your money with an eye on the long term. All these things. So I think you have to try to put an element of trust in there. Because sometimes people are, are so emotionally scarred when it comes to money or they, they just have made so many mistakes that they need to just let it out of their hands. Let someone else take care of it and just if there's a – element of trust there, you let them take the steering wheel. I think you also have to help her figure out what the money's for in the first place. So it's not that you said it's supplementary. So is it going to end up supplementing her pension income at some point? Will she even need the money? Maybe some of this will just be passed down to kids and grandkids. And that's a way to pull on those emotional strings to help her figure out what to do. So I would appeal more to emotions than the math of it all. And I do like the fact that you're starting out with a target date fund here for simplicity and diversification and low cost. I knew you were going to uh, love that. It, yeah, you, it, you it good makes. I think that's a that's a pretty good first step as opposed to picking individual stocks for her or something. So I would I would go for the emotions of it, but I, I totally understand where someone in Japan would be coming from in terms of being pretty nervous about it. But I like the fact that if 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 you're handling it for her, that that there's an element of trust there and she can hopefully let go and just go for it. Yeah, that was that was something when I first started working with you guys years ago. I had to get used to was all the comments of you know, what about Japan? Literally, that was the response to almost everything that we put out. Someone would be like, what about Japan in the comments? It's just kind of funny. It really is an outlier. And the reason that returns were so awful is because the bubble was so enormous to begin with. And it, I think it really was the biggest financial asset bubble that we've ever had. And the funny thing is, if you read this book, Devil Take the Hindmost, Japan really, as a people, as a culture, they have a very conservative nature. So the fact that it happened there was kind of crazy to begin with. And again, there's a bunch of reasons why it happened, but it, it is, it was just an insane, insane bubble. Yeah. Crazy. All right. Next Speaking question. Of Japan, I'm looking forward to the next season of Tokyo Vice. It's a good I show. like that one. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, up next, we have a question from uh, Janelle, I think is how you say it. Uh, I'm a single 32-year-old woman that makes $70,000 a year in South Florida. I have a net worth of around $220,000. 87000 of this is cash sitting in a high-yield savings account earning 4% right now. This savings was originally designated for a home purchase, but with rising home prices, it's been tough to find an affordable home. It's not worth it to buy where I am, so I'm considering moving to a more affordable area. My question is this. Is there a better place to park my cash that is still liquid for the long term if I don't buy right away? I figure about 50000 is for a house and the rest is an emergency fund. I think I should just stop saving and continue to invest uh, my future earnings in the stock market through my 401k and brokerage. Do you think this would be a good idea? So good a for Janelle. They're really thinking question, through right? things. 
Yes, I, I agree. First of all, yeah, good on you for saving up for down payment and being realistic about the affordability in your area. I don't know exactly where you live, but if you look at the house price gains in Miami, for instance, relative to the rest of the country, John, do a chart on here of, of Miami housing prices. Uh, do the next one. There you go. So this is Case Schiller uh, Home Price Index for Miami and then nationally. And this is since the start of the pandemic at the end of 2019. And you can see house prices in Miami, they've, they've sort of leveled out, but up way more than the rest of the country. I know a lot of people don't want to move to a more affordable area of the country because of friends or family or work or just inertia. But if this is an option, I think it's something that you have control over where you could go somewhere cheaper, uh, Duncan. No, no hints here for you, Duncan. But John, throw up the next chart. Uh, Lance Lambert from Fortune made this one for me, and it shows the typical median home value by region. And you can see the orange there is a uh, median home value of 350000 to 500000 and Florida is filling up with that pretty good. California has more in the seven fifty and up range, which is, which is kind of tough to stomach. But look at all these other places, even in the, in the southeast, where you could potentially move if you want to stick in that area where home prices are more affordable. It, you know, I, I think if, if you have that, that makes a lot of sense. So as far as the, the cash investments go, 4% is about average as far as online savings accounts go. I think Marcus up the rate to 4.15% this week after the Fed raised rates. Most of them should be plus or minus something or right around there. They're now uh, matching might be a little the higher, Apple a little savings lower. account rate, right? Yep, that's four about time. Now. You could earn a little more in ultra short-term bonds if you wanted to. One to six month T-bills are yielding north of 5% right now. I think it depends how much that extra 1% or so means to you. So one, you have 87,000 in cash, she said, right? 1% on $87,000 in cash is $870 a year. It's not bad, but it's not life-changing money. So I don't know, is it really worth it to move it around and buy a short-term T-bill ETF or try to buy T-bills on your own? You could, but I think a savings account, an online savings account is probably easier in terms of moving money around and, and that sort of thing. Uh, part three of the question is how much you should save. So you obviously have a large cash allocation relative to your net worth because you're saving up for a house. So 87000 out of 220, we we're looking at like 40% in cash. So she's got a really big cash buffer relative to her net worth. I think as long as you're comfortable with that amount in a down payment, then yeah, future savings should be funneled towards... Uh, the stock market or the 401k and tax for retirement accounts. So you could do a quick back of the envelope. You said $50,000 for the down payment. If you did 20,000 or 20% down payment, that's a $250,000 house of 50K. If you did a 10% down payment, that's a half a million dollar house. And if you only did five, that's a million dollar house. I don't know what you can afford, but that's kind of how you can think about the down payment and how far it will get you in terms of how much leverage you want to take. The good news is you have the ability to save. Like the fact that you've put aside that much cash, I think is a good thing. Now, yeah, I, I would, at, at your age and where you are, start funneling more of that into the market. And now that you have that cash buffer, you should feel pretty good about yourself. And But you've already reached the most important first step. So I, I think you're in a very good place. You know something I realized having just moved out of you know New York City to Connecticut, uh, something that a lot of young people and myself included are guilty of is clinging to like living in a big city for like the name of it and like kind of there's almost like a prestige, I guess, of being like, oh, I live in Brooklyn or oh, I live in Manhattan, you know, and I'm sure the same with Miami and a lot of big cities. And at a certain point, I just got to where I was like, I, I don't care about that anymore. Like, I want to I want to go where, like, it's livable and where things are more affordable, you know. And if you're not going to to use all the things that are great about a big city, you're you're just paying up for no, it's like a tax on yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. at a certain point, you want a Costco as opposed to a local little bodega. Right. Right. Or drive as opposed to the subway. Okay. Right. Up next, next. question three, we have a question from Will. I run a one member consulting LLC and was looking at SEP IRAs. I saw that there's a new Roth option as part of the December 22 uh, legislation. I need you to remind me what SEP means. We can, we can wait until after. Uh, can I contribute to both the SEP Roth and my own personal Roth? There's conflicting advice out there about whether the Roth limits impact one another. Side note, when I started doing research on my question, I came across a random internet article. I started reading the article and I thought I was reading Bill Sweet because of the Roth gushing. It wasn't him, but it was that giant of personal finance, Susie Orman. Does Bill get confused for her often? <laughs> Don't know, compliment or, or shade, you know, no way Let's to know. Let's bring in Susie Sweet now, I guess, and, yeah. and ask him. Uh, Bill, you don't have the bangs hey, of Susie Orman, so I'm guessing, I'm guessing not. So SEP is what, Simplified Employee Pension? Employer, is that right? 
Yeah, you've got it. Yeah, and I have to tell you, people are always asking me if I know Tyler Durden. This is the first time I've been confused for Susie Orman outside of a New York City drab club. So this is the very first time. Not a lot of those up in Milford, Connecticut, I'd imagine, Duncan. Um, but I, I'm Bill, not here to you, judge. Yeah. You helped me set up a SEP yes. IRA uh, four or five years ago. I didn't know about this Roth option. Yeah, and, uh, well, it's new. So what's the, what's the story? I didn't, I didn't know about this. Tell me about it. Yeah, so Duncan, uh, SEP is a simplified employee pension plan, and it's basically a way for small businesses to turbocharge retirement contributions, but they're using kind of a hybrid of the IRA structure. And the biggest difference between your traditional sort of standard IRA that you or I can contribute to are the income limits. Uh, this year, we can do about $6,500 per subject to income limits, but a SEP IRA a is not subject to income limits, uh, and then B, you can do up to the 415C limit in 2023. That's $66,000. Now you have to have a lot of income to to contribute that much. It's limited about 20% of your of your net income, uh, but that's a big one. And so, uh, what Will is taking a look at here before he went down a really weird rabbit hole with who I uh, look like and don't look like <laughs> is uh, the uh, Consolidated the Omnibus Act bill, Ben, uh, in uh, Secure Act 2.0, as it's colloquially known in the industry, uh, basically changed the way that certain contributions could be made. And uh, he's 100% right. Will is, Will is on it. You can do now a SEP Roth IRA as of January 1st, 2023. Uh, and ultimately, I think that, that's an awesome option, right? I, I think I have the back tattoo, first episode of Portfolio Rescue, now as the compound, back tattoo says Roth IRA conversion. I'm into this stuff. So I think ultimately it's a great option. You just need to weigh the tax pros and cons. And there are some unanswered questions in the legislation, which we'll get to in a second. All right. So, so they can do the Roth, so they, yep. they might as well, right? I, I mean, I think so. You need to know a lot about what's going on. But uh, what Will sort of asked is, you know, d does this impact my ability to do a, a regular Roth IRA, right? Because why not have your cake and eat it too? If you can dump in $60,000 into a SEP, why not do the additional $6,500 too? And unfortunately, the answer to that, Ben, is we don't know. Um, the, 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 the omnibus bill was passed, I think, on December 29th of last year. And the IRS, even though it's May now, they haven't gone around to uh, promulgating guidance. So we don't actually know if the, Seth, the SEP Roth IRA contribution is going to be subject to FICA tax, as another example. We don't know if you're going to need to report that income, assuming it's not a single member LLC on a W-2 or 1099. And we do not know if you're able to contribute to a SEP Roth IRA for 2022, because as you might know, Ben, you can contribute to a SEP IRA up to the extension deadline all the way in October. So there's a couple of unanswered questions here, but I think all things being equal, more Roth, better, better than not enough Roth. So I would say go for it, Will. See, this is why, did you become a Bill, did you get into accounting and tax because of Andy Dufresne? Is he your hero? Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I rewatched that scene today, and that you'd survive prison pretty well, I think. Well, I, I appreciate that. I didn't know if that was a compliment or, or an insult. I, I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with Susie Orman. Again, I'm not sure what exactly is going on here. Or is this an insult to Susie Orman? I don't know. Um, but no. What was going on backstage was, I love that movie so much. It's, it's a foundational film for me. I was so upset when Forrest Gump won the Oscar. I guess I understand, but come on. In, in the annals of film, give me a break. Uh, looking backwards in hindsight, which one would you rather watch on a Tuesday you know, night with your kids? Uh, the prison scene, obviously, is, is, is awful. It's the worst part of the film. Um, but uh, that said, I, you didn't see backstage. I was trying to smash the unmute button because I wanted to chime in and comment. Uh, but John John blocked me. He, uh, he, he, he prison blocked me at the You're door. not going to get that by, John. Nope. No, nope. never. All right, let's do another also, one. Sean says in the in the chat, you know, you keep talking about this tattoo, but no one's seen it. So just, <laughs> I was did. It I was putting life? my shirt on when the camera turned on today, as you guys know. It's like a, it's like a Tupac one, Roth life as opposed to thug life. <laughs> I, I want to make a shirt that says, when in doubt, Roth it out, and have people uh, wear that. I like That'd that. I like that. All right, up next, we have a question from Colin. I got married last year, and after doing our taxes, it turns out that my wife and I have been phased out annoyingly by uh, only $1,000 or so of being able to contribute to a Roth IRA. I had already maxed out my contribution for 2022 and was on my way for 2023. I have a rollover uh, IRA from a previous employer, and Vanguard is saying that if I don't want to pay taxes on the total account amount when I transfer, I need to move that rollover IRA to my current 401k. To do this, I would need to liquidate everything, which I don't want to do because I like the ETFs I have and I don't want to give up on the compounding interest. What is the easiest way to move Roth IRA contributions to a rollover IRA while minimizing taxes and not having to sell? This gets back to my idea that we should have one mulligan. You get to make one mistake within reason, plus or minus some percentage of your AGI, and the IRS calls it good, right? Especially when you get so close to the Roth thing, right? 
It's like playing, I played Operation with my kids this weekend, where you get to the side and it buzzes you, you know? Yeah, it's a classic, yeah. Yeah, so the other thing is the rollover process from a 401k to IRA is a nightmare in this country. You have to, like, sell everything, then they send you a check, like, two or three weeks later, then you yeah. have to deposit. It's it's so antiquated, and I know why they do this, yeah. because they don't want you to move money from them. But what what is going on here if he, he's he's over the limit because they're income came in a little higher than, than expected, and he's doing a rollover. What's uh, what's going on here? Because I'm Yeah, confused. so Colin forgot to say the magic words, uh, not to brag. This is only a problem if you're earning more than $214,000 a year of taxable income. So good for you, good job, Colin. Colin. Congratulations. Yeah, good yeah. Uh, good on you. So I, I think what he's getting at, Ben, is I think he's thinking he wants to set the conditions to do backdoor Roth IRA contributions going forward. Uh, because as we've discussed many times on the show, there's no income limit to contribute to a traditional IRA, and there's no income limit to convert that traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. But Colin's going to run into a problem, uh, known as the pro rata rule, that is, he, if he has a large IRA balance, anything that he hasn't paid tax on is going to be taxed when he goes in that conversion pro rata. So if he has $60,000 set aside, he contributes 6000 90% of that conversion is going to be taxable, and that's obviously not advantageous. It kind of defeats the whole purpose, right, of doing a, that, that backdoor Roth. So the solution, Colin already figured it out. Use your employer-sponsored 401k plan. Uh, he mentions a fantastic company, uh, Vanguard, uh, and they have a lot of great ETFs, Ben, some of which we are very familiar with here uh, at our company and, and elsewhere, and I think a very reputable company. I, I would take a, a hard second look at that, Colin, about, about that. Uh, and further to me, the, I understand you, you don't want to liquidate your investments. You, you fell in love with your ETFs. You got married. You don't want to let them go. I, I get it. But you kind of need to balance that versus what you could get on the other side. And Ben, you're right. It's probably going to take you two to three weeks to, to make this happen. But two to three weeks in the, in, the, in the time span of 40 to 50 years, probably not a big deal, in my opinion. Right. I, it's, I'd take it's a annoying, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's annoying, but it's not going to be the end of the yep. world. Yep. So probably the only other thing I could throw at you, Colin, if you have any self-employment income, you could set up a, your own solo 401k. So that's something that you can always consider if you do happen to own a business. Unfortunately, if you know if you have a single employer, that's not an option. But Vanguard to me is among the upper echelon of, of reputable providers. So so I'd look at it because then you could have your cake. Uh, you could eat it too. There's just some confusion. He, he says something about easiest way to move Roth area conversions to Roth rollover IRAs. That's not a thing. Um, if you over contributed I, for I a prior year, yeah, you have to take an excess distribution. You had to do it by the tax deadline. Unfortunately, hopefully you filed an extension. And if you don't, you're just, you're paying a 6% excise tax and the IRS can come slap you with up to now a 25% penalty for any excess contributions. So Colin, talk to your tax professional about this, but, uh, you know, for what it, you're, you're going to get what it's worth, it's free advice. But like, I, I would take a strong look at, at doing an excess uh, distribution, get that out of your account as soon as possible. And so I'm, I'm looking at the live chat here. Did I see Duncan's mom is in the chat today? Whoa. <laughs> My mom is, is often in the chat to be fair. Your mom but is yeah. proud of you. She Duncan. is. She wants to yeah, see you yeah. at work. I think that's beautiful, man. All right. Yeah. Miss Hill, you raised a fine son. We're, we're very proud of, to have Duncan <laughs> oh, as part God. of our team. Oh, boy. People, people in the comments aren't paying attention it's to the great. show. They're just talking to your mom now. It's a family like. affair. Yeah. But what does she think about rollover Roth oh, IRA conversions? Uh, well, you know, I think that uh, one thing I was going to ask you about is the, the thing about compounding interest. I mean, mm -hmm. that doesn't stop just because you roll over, right? I mean, your, your accounts are still. No. I mean, Let's yeah, you, can, that you might miss out a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it's like you go to cash for a couple weeks, then you get back in. So it's not yeah, like I, th the... I think that's what Ben highlighted at the onset. That's what he's worried about. Its process takes, unfortunately, a month from providers. Again, I think Vanguard's a very good company, and I, I would I would take a second look at it. Also, you can you can time the the transfer, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it could work right. in his favor. I mean, that's true. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. we don't know. It's easy for me to tell right. what's going to happen three weeks from now, in three weeks. All right, next All right. one. Okay, up next we have a question from Brad. I'm 34 years old. And I live in a state with no income tax, and my salary is in the 22% bracket. I started a new job that has a 401k with a Roth option. I can max out my 401k contribution by splitting my contribution between traditional and Roth. My employer's plan has a safe harbor match after a year that would add 4%, but I'm not currently receiving a match. Am I better off maxing out my 401k in multiple buckets or saving a lower percentage by having it all in Roth? Can, can you guys explain safe harbor? I, I don't know what that means. Have at it, Bill. See, yeah, I think so. Bill's so, always Bill's runs the 401k at our place, basically. So 
He can, I do. He can take I am, one. I'm your plan administrator. Um, no, the safe harbor, Duncan, is simply that it allows for a certain type of contribution, specifically kind of toward executives, that ultimately, if you give everybody a free 3 or 4%, the safe harbor you know, minimum is 3%. I guess they're a little bit more generous like us. They're doing 4%. If you're doing that and matching contributions, effectively, you can, you can sort of tilt the dial. You don't have to go through some of the really complicated Department of Labor, uh, high compensated employee tests. And so the 401k plan is a people's plan. Uh, most, most plans are, and ultimately there's a test that applies each year that says, hey, if you have too much money in your highest paid folks, we're gonna, we're gonna declare this plan uh, not, not valid, and they're gonna make uh, the distribution happen from the, from the higher compensated folks. So if you go safe harbor route, you, everybody gets 4% or 3% minimum, but you don't have to go through some of the more stringent tests. It's a pretty tests. good deal. So my it guess is. is as much as you like a Roth, IRA or 401k, if they, for whatever reason, have to split this and give, give them a bigger match, you would probably recommend splitting because you can't really get, even the, the tax benefits of the Roth in the future are not going to be better than 100% return on the, the match, right? Yeah, I, th I think you're right. And, and they're, you know, Brad says he's not getting a, a safe harbor match, so I don't know that it really comes into play. Most plans would allow for a match on on either traditional or Roth, so I don't I don't think that's necessarily a factor. But his real question is, you know, should should I should I split this? Like, should I have a, a split? You know, Brad, if we could see in the future know exactly what your tax rate is going to be at sixty four, like we kind of know at thirty four, we'd be able to answer that question very specifically. I've got no problem if you don't know the the right answer, just diversify, right? I think, guys, I, I've got the back tattoo. We talked about Roth. I'm pushing Roth. I think the audience of asset compounds skews relatively younger. I could be wrong about that. I think early in our career, let's say 20s, 30s, Roth, Roth is going to be the way to go. But there's a there's a big case, a huge case uh, for traditional contributions. And if you're not sure, if you kind of think that my tax rate lower, it might be lower in retirement. Traditional contributions could be the best option for you. And so, Brad, I think I think if you if you can't if you in the inability in to see the future, splitting the baby in half doesn't make a, a that, that makes a ton of sense to me. I'd, I'd keep doing what you're doing, Brad, in the absence of, of perfect information. It's funny you mentioned the age of people in the chat because the other day, or it's been several weeks, I think, David Wysocki, who's often in the, the chat on our shows, yeah, my guy. said something about being 72 years old. It's great. I just assumed I that he was, that, you know, I was just picturing like a 30-something-year-old. He's a something. young man at heart. I mean, yeah, exactly. You, God bless him. He's chat. got 30 years left. So, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd urge a Roth contribution for, for him as anyone else. Bringing up the averages. All right, we yeah. got one more. Okay. Uh, last but not least, we have a question from Tom. I'm married, filing jointly with $150,000 income. I have four to five years of short-term capital losses from 2022 of $13,000. I used $3,000 of the losses against our 2022 income. If I have $3,000 of long-term capital gains in 2023, do I pay the lower rate on the long-term capital gains while still deducting $3,000 against our income with the short-term capital losses? Maybe a small potatoes question compared to some of the not to brag questions. There's no small potatoes on S. No, now. no. This is this is a show for the people. All right. So, he, Bill, I got a question about the carrying losses over. So yes. you have a you have a certain amount. You have ten thousand dollars of losses this year. You can carry over three thousand from that couple of years. Does the IRS just hope that you're going to forget about those carryover losses? Is that is that why they do it? Why can't we just take them all in one year? It happens sometimes. Uh, my partner in crime here, Bill Arzeroni and CPA, who I, I've not spent any time in jail with, but uh, he's he's my battle buddy. Uh, he he would he would correct you on that, Ben. He would say that uh, you can deduct three thousand dollars against your ordinary income. Right, and so then the remainder carries forward. And the reason I mention him is we see a lot of bad tax work, to be honest, Ben. And one of the more common things is they miss some some folks. Uh, unfortunately, when they pick up a new a new client, they don't catch that carry forward number from last year or the prior years, right? So if you're meeting with a new tax professional and they haven't in detail reviewed your prior year's tax return, massive red flag, right? That they're not doing their due diligence. Um, but Ben, to your point, no, they do carry forward indefinitely, right? I mean, I imagine there's some people that lost a lot of money uh, during COVID or, or maybe in the, in the dot-com era, they're still deducting their capital losses, let's say from 20 years ago, because if you're only able to deduct $3,000 a year, uh, that doesn't go very far in, in the context of some of the, some of the larger, some larger losses. So let's, let's talk about, let's talk about ordering. So Ben, to answer the question just directly, this is the answer. Uh, any law, any losses that are carried forward into a future tax year are considered long-term in nature by the time that next year rolls around, which kind of makes sense, right? If you if you if you have a, a short versus long-term loss, you hold that for a year. Anything that you've held a short term a year later is, is going to be long-term, right? Because the holding period is is a year, and we're talking about a year periods here. So the ordering rules work like this: short-term losses offset short-term gains on the tax form. Makes sense. Then you get a net short-term okay. number. Long-term losses, less long-term carry-forward losses, 
less offset long-term gains. So again, from the prior year, that number is magically transformed into long-term loss because it happened more than a year ago. Then you get a net long-term gain. Then net uh, short Turn losses or gains. I got the Zach Galifianakis numbers going on right now. <laughs> I was and, thinking uh, the same. This is why I just let you do my taxes, Bill, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm lost. Well, this is why I let the, the software handle it, right? So I'm not even doing this calculus. I'm not Galifianakis in this, this, this stuff here. So ultimately, it all goes into a blender, and then you pay tax on what's left. And so to give you guys an example, stick with me here for a second. Let's say that I have a $3,000 short-term gain. I'm not drawing this down, Duncan. Don't, don't laugh at me. A $3,000 short-term gain, a $3,000 long-term gain, and I have $5,000 lost carry forward. So the net gain I have there is 1000 Is that short or, lo or long? Duncan, which one is it based on what I've told you? Uh, 50, I, I 50, wasn't 50, paying Duncan. that close of attention. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that is, that is going to be a short-term gain because, as I said before, the, the ordering steps are the long-term carry forward offsets, long-term gains first, and then they get put in a blender. So in that instance, in that case, that would be a net short-term gain. Does that answer the question, Ben? Yes. We do need a whiteboard. <laughs> I think. I on think the so. next Ask the Compound, we'll I, do this on a whiteboard. I, I do have a, no, I I do have a little bit of a follow-up question. You, I think you yes, basically sir. just answered it, but just to like distill it down, I have a friend who I was talking to recently who was telling me he lost quite a bit in the market last year, and I was telling him about this very thing, you know, being able to write off up to 3000 and he was like, oh, I don't think my tax guy did that. Is there mm. like anything you can do after the fact to like – or or is it just too late? Can you like amend your, your return? What, yeah. what are your options there? Great question. So ultimately, take a look at Schedule D, page two, and if you see a loss on that page two at the top and then a $3,000 number that flows up through Schedule one and then on the front page of the 1040, you'll see negative $3,000. If that number ain't there, you're right, Duncan, your, your buddy, something went wrong. To answer your question directly, yes, you can, off, you can amend a tax return up to three years uh, after the filing deadline. And that means right now, uh, tax year 2020 returns are up for amendment. But as you remember, there's all that COVID weirdness. Uh, the, the amendment deadline is actually July, uh, July 15th, 2023 for tax returns filed in 2020. So I would yeah, advise this, him to take a look. It seems obvious, but some people think I lost a ton of money last year. It depends if you actually locked in those losses, too. It's not just a good paper point. loss. Very good right? point. For, I think some people might might misunderstand that, but like it has to, has to be something that you, you yep. sold for a loss, not just yep. you, you were down last year. Right, yeah, right, back right. to back to the question about compound interest in ETFs. If that's in an IRA, it just keeps compounding, right? I mean, your, your gain just rolls into your new account. You don't have to realize any gains on it. So, yeah, Ben, I think that would be something to look at. Uh, Duncan, uh, get your get your friend a copy of his 2022 1040. We'll take a look at it. Cool. See, this we'll is why it. we have our own Andy Dufresne on staff here. <laughs> yeah. he that's what I'm here all. for. Exactly, yeah. And I'll see you at San Juan Taneo. I'm on just, vacation this week, so uh, I am actually heading to the beach. Um, just wait so. until, uh, until how exciting this all gets when we start taxing and taking into account unrealized gains and losses, right? That's going to be fun. Yeah, and that's the nightmare, right? And that's always the thing that gets thrown in my face on Twitter. It's like, what if the IRS taxes your Roth IRAs? Well, uh, okay, well, what if they start taxing, you know, my back my back tattoo, right? I mean, yeah, we could plan for yeah. for anything. My comment this morning was people in the finance world spend 95% of the time worrying about stuff that could happen 5% of the time. Right. And, and what right. about... Let's focus on what's actually happening, not what could happen. I like focus that. on what drag queen Susie, Susie Orman's into. Go, uh, there go, go enjoy the beach. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Right, remember, you can email us, askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. But also, if you want to send us a voice memo or a video from your phone, feel free to do that. We will play it right here. If you want to we're, personalize we're it a little more, if anyone wants... Yeah, yeah anyone wants to do that. We're, we're thinking about setting up a voicemail, but you can easily do a voicemail. We'll send us that or send us a video of yourself if you're, if you're willing. Uh, thanks to everyone in the live chat for showing up, especially Duncan's mom. <laughs> We always appreciate yeah. it. Uh, she did if you're a great job. In podcast Duncan. form, yeah. Leave us a Big review, fan. hit like, subscribe, all that stuff, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye, guys.